morning after after that little parade. Uh, <laughs> welcome to Charlottesville. If you're not from here, we're so glad to have you here this morning. Welcome to all the folks from Charlottesville. It's nice to see your faces. Um, hope you all are enjoying how warm it is. It's a little humid, so it kind of feels nice. Um, it is a beautiful day for Creative Mornings, and I'm so happy that we're back after our little break for the winter. Um, so I'm going to kick us off by sharing my screen, so bear with me for one moment. All right. So like I said, welcome. Good morning. Um, we've already done a great job at this, but participation is always encouraged. There's emojis, so if something resonates with you throughout the talk this morning, feel free to use those. Um, feel free to um, uh, use the chat to share um, ideas and that sort of thing. We always like to start things with a group photo. So if you'd like to be a part of it and have your camera on, go ahead and do so. Um, I'm just gonna make our windows here a little bigger so I can see everybody. If you've got pets who are in the vicinity and you'd like them to be a part of your photograph, your little box, bring them on up. Mine has finally laid down, so I'm not gonna bother her. All right, where's my cursor? There's my cursor. All right, I'm gonna count us off. And we're gonna take a couple because you know you gotta you gotta have a couple to pick from. All right, ready? One, two, three, cheese. All right. And oh, somehow I made everything full screen. Hold on. Haven't done this in a minute. One more. One, two, three, cheese. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for bring your mugs. I should have done that. Why didn't I do that? All right, so Creative Mornings is a global organization. We're in 223 chapters um, or cities across the globe in 67 countries with 27,000 attendees per month, 9,600 uh, talks online and 11.6 million video views. So we are truly extensive and truly connected, which is great. And our theme for February is monumental. This was chosen by a Richmond chapter. Um, so hence the, the regards to that monument that is now completely taken down, which is great. Um, we always like to acknowledge our partners. So our global sponsor is MailChimp. Last year, MailChimp reached out to freelancers and independent agencies to learn about the nuts and bolts of their businesses. Uh, what they learned is how they price their services, how to acquire new clients, how to staff their projects, and plenty more. This helped them create the 2021 MailChimp and Co. Benchmark Report, an invaluable resource for understanding how marketing pros stack up against their peers and revealing what top performers do differently. The 2020 survey lot is live and MailChimp is looking for feedback. So we've got that link for you in the, in the chat. And then we also like to thank our local partners. So those are Worth Higgins and Associates, Ting, The Fralin, Willow Tree, UVA Arts, The Bridge, and New City Arts. And we have a couple of announcements uh, coming from some of our folks here. The first from Willow Tree, and I think several folks from Willow Tree are on today, so thanks so much for your continued support. We love having you here. Um, I think Jeremy's got this one for us. Yeah, and this will be quick. It's the same announcement as every time, uh, but we're hiring. We're a digital product agency with offices in Charlottesville, Virginia, Durham, North Carolina, Columbus, Ohio, and uh, new since last time, Vancouver, British Columbia, um, if anyone knows anyone up there. So we are hiring for designers, content designers, SEO folks, analytics folks, engineering folks, um, just check the URL, see if any of the roles appeal to you and apply or reach out with any questions. Thanks. Great, thanks Jeremy. Great, next um, we've got the bridge. Emma, are you taking this or Jeremy? 
Sure. No, we've got an amazing show. These are our collaborative uh, residents, the three artists who work together to create a really fun show at the bridge, Parasitic Plasticity. Uh, it'll be up through the end of February. I encourage you to go and see it. Um, a lot can be seen through the windows um, or reach out to me if you want an inside view. I can meet you there anytime. Great. Thank you, Emma. All right, next we have the Fraylin. I'm going to check and see. Sarah, I think Sarah's on. Great. Good morning, everyone. Um, yes, we are excited to have um, recently opened some new exhibitions, uh, including Alternative Futures, which is a video exhibition, um, one for Gundaran sculpture, um, and then several uh, by our um, student uh, curators for our university internship course and one of our fellows. So please do um, stop by. Admission is always free. Um, lots of great programming on our website and small business. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks so much, Sarah. And last but certainly not least, New City Arts with a very familiar face. Hey everyone. Good morning. I am just going to tee up Jess to talk about uh, what they listed as their monumental accomplishment. Um, Real quick, for the second year in a row, uh, we invited artists to apply with projects that are connected to a theme that they wanted to work on at Welcome Gallery. Um, and uh, five artists were selected to transform the gallery into their studio between now and June. So they're each working for uh, about four weeks. And then um, all the work that they create opens during the first Friday at the end of their fellowship. Um, and uh, they each get a stipend and uh, we stock the fridge with their favorite snacks for the month. Um, and Jess is our first fellow and it's been really fun to have them in the gallery um, these last few weeks. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jess to talk more about uh, their exhibition that opens first Friday in March. Thank you, Maureen and everyone here. Um, uh, yeah, so my exhibition is opening up in March and it's mostly just exploring my personal journey through end stage kidney disease and um, I'm also reflecting some stories of other patients that are currently waiting for transplant within our community. I have uh, some appointments to set up for interview. Uh, I have a little studio set up there. It's, it's really a combination of all of the work that I've um, done or planned to do uh, over the last three years while going through the transition of um, physically dying and enduring dialysis and then being given uh, an organ from a living donor and then going full throttle into my advocacy work that is necessary for my daily survival. And I'm hoping to share that with this community and make some awareness happen on some very critical things that are going on right now. So thank you for having me and I, I hope I look forward to sharing it with you all. Amazing, thanks Jess. Okay, so we are looking for someone who likes social media or wants to volunteer with the creative community and, and finding a way to do that. Um, we are looking for someone who can help us stay coordinated with our social media. Um, so if you are interested or if you'd like to volunteer with the team, uh, we would be so happy to have you shoot me an email at charlottesville at creativemornings.com. And if you came by way of invitation by a friend or, or whatnot and are not on our newsletter, we've got that here for you um, as well. So that's creativemornings.com slash city slash CVL slash newsletter. All right. And before we get to our talk, we always like to have our virtual manifesto um, read by a participant. So um, you can, if you've got your camera on, you can raise your hand if you'd like to read for us today, um, and I can also keep an eye on the chat and the participant um, pane. But would anybody like to read for us this morning? I'll read. All right, great, thank you. Everyone is creative. A creative life requires bravery and action honesty and hard work. We are here to support you, celebrate with you, and encourage you to make the things you love. We believe in the power of community. We believe in giving a damn. 
We believe in face-to-face -face connections, in learning from others, in jazz hands, virtual claps, and virtual snaps. We bring together people who are driven by passion and purpose, confident that they will inspire one another and inspire change in neighborhoods and cities around the world. Everyone is welcome. Thank you so much. All right, it is time for me to introduce our speaker for this morning. So let me pull up Jelene's bio. Jelaine Schmidt is the director of the UVA Democracy Initiatives Memory Project and an associate professor of religious studies. As a scholar of African diaspora, Caribbean, and Latin American religions, she has conducted field research for three years in Cuba and is the author of Kachita Streets, The Virgin of Charity, Race, and Revolution in Cuba, a study of Cuban national identity, religion, politics, and public events. Dr. Schmidt teaches courses on race and social change movements, and she serves on the City of Charlottesville Historic Resources Committee. With community partners, she plans, leads, plans and leads walking tours, pilgrimages, and other public history events focused upon Civil War memory, Jim Crow, and the history of the local African American community and civil rights movement. As a scholar activist, Jelaine organized progressives turn out to the 2016 Blue Ribbon Commission on Race, Memorials, and Public Spaces public hearings, which shifted public opinion to favor the removal of the Confederate statues. Jelaine helped found a local chapter of Black Lives Matter. She participated in Charlottesville's 2017 Summer of Hate counter demonstrations, and her political involvement in confronting white supremacy is ongoing. Jelaine co-founded Take Him Down Seville and the 2020 Monumental Justice Virginia Campaign, which organized affiliates statewide and successfully lobbied the Virginia Assembly to overturn a century-old state law, which had prohibited localities from removing Confederate statues. Jelaine writes op-ed pieces and speaks about democratizing public space, and she is writing a book about Charlottesville Civil War and Reconstruction era local neo-Confederate organizations and their Jim Crow monuments, and also resistance to white supremacy. The Memory Project is a supporter of the Swords and Duplow Shirts effort to repurpose the bronze from Charlottesville's Lee statue in order to create new public art. Jelaine's first documentary film, Unveiling the Origin of Charlottesville's Monuments, will be released soon. Please join me in welcoming Jelaine. Um, and one quick note, um, if you've got questions, we'll do a Q&A session afterwards. Please uh, private chat those to me and I will moderate that session. So thank you and <coughs> Jelaine, off to you. All right, let's see. And do I have permission to share my screen? You do. Okay, awesome. Here we go. Um, so I wanted to uh, talk for a minute about uh, uh, a project that is ongoing that many of you are supporters of. It's so great to look out and see, uh, you know, uh, Jeremy Sternman, uh, Corey Price, of course, Jess Walters, um, uh, so many people, Maureen uh, Brondike and so many others that are connected with the arts organizations that are supporting the Swords into Plowshares project. So I'm really um, glad to be here and to talk a little bit more with artist folks because we um, want even more involvement um, from, from uh, artists in our community. Um, so I'm just going to quickly do a quick recap of, of, of you know, our monumental spaces, uh, you know, here in Charlottesville. Um, of course, uh, you know, I kind of, I like to start with, uh, you know, kind of a, just a demographic breakdown at the time of the Civil War, the majority of the population here locally was enslaved. And I always want to hit on that because um, once you know that, you realize that these monuments that were our, our propaganda that, you know, for the losing side, you know, they were meant to um, instill uh, a certain, you know, veneration of, of, of the losing side, you know. Um, and uh, the installation ceremonies themselves in the 1920s uh, were large scale spectacles. Uh, people came from all over the state. You know, there were dignitaries. They often coincided with reunions of Confederate and neo-Confederate organizations uh, that, that planned them. Um, the sorts of uh, speeches that were given at these installation uh, ceremonies for these monuments are quite revealing because they often, uh, included harangues against the Reconstruction era, um, uh, you know, in, in which um, 
black people uh, uh, gained their rights, you know, former slaves uh, uh, gained rights of citizenship and, and voting ostensibly, but then this was, of course, rolled back. And so, you know, lots, lots of, you know, mention in these speeches about, you know, we're, we're putting things in the right order again. You know, it's, it's, it's very deliberate. We're not making this up when we say this, this is about white supremacy, you know, that, uh, that that's going on. Um, you know, and, and of course, these are commissioned monuments. And Charlottesville was uh, unusual for a town, a southern town of its size at that time to have these commissioned uh, monuments of, of, of this size. I mean, every little town had a Johnny Reb statue, which which we had here as well in front of the courthouse, but to have these large scale commissioned bronze monuments uh, was quite unusual and it was quite a draw. Um, uh, for, for, and, and, and this is at the same time in the 1920s that uh, Monticello is bought by the Thomas Jefferson Foundation and there's a tourism in, um, infrastructure being built up around that. So, you know, this is quite a kind of hustle bustle little town, you know, kind of trying to, to leave its mark with public art and we hope to redirect that energy toward public art that is, of course, you know, more inclusive and, and you know, again, kind of claim that mantle, but uh, with different values this time. Um, so of course, uh, you know, as we probably know, uh, one Ziana Bryant, uh, just then a, a freshman in high school, started the petition to remove the Lee statue, um, you know, and, and got uh, numerous signatures. You know, here they are at a press conference, and you can see here uh, Wes Bellamy, then the the vice mayor and and councilwoman uh, uh, to the far right, uh, actually to the left, but anyway, in this picture on the right. Uh, uh, is Christian uh, Zakas, who was the first one to kind of publicly mention that maybe just we might think about, you know, removing these statues that was in 2012 at the Festival of the Book. And she said there were audible gasps <laughs> in the audience when she said this, you know, uh, and she started getting death threats and her, you know, threats to her family. You know, and that was in 2012, you know, and then, you know, four years later comes Ziana Bryant with her petition and then a move uh, before uh, uh, council to uh, form a blue ribbon commission to kind of take the temperature of the of the public and to allow forums, public forums. We love community engagement in this town. It's kind of part of our legacy of you know kind of civic uh, engagement more generally that we take very seriously. Um, and these meetings in, in 2016 went on for about six months every two weeks. Um, there was a, what I call a cuss and discuss, you know, getting together. And here, here's a picture of the Blue Ribbon Commission that are, you know, in, in our foreground here uh, on the panel uh, facing the audience. And you can see people at the microphones uh, uh, speaking their piece about, you know, what they thought of this. Um, now, usually Blue Ribbon, you know, commissions are where good ideas go to die. Usually this is where elected bodies kind of send controversial um, issues and uh, then you know a, a few months later the uh, the commission comes back with a lengthy report and then it gets put you know and many thanks and pats on the back and then it gets put on the shelf and nothing happens. Um, in this case, though, uh, there's a quite consequential vote um, in city council in in uh, February uh, 2017. You know to remove the Lee statue uh, at, at that point in a very close and contested vote, of course, um, as some of us remember. And this kind of brought out, you know, politicians that, uh, you know, wanted to use the issue of Confederate memorialization of, of Confederate monuments as a, as a campaign issue, as we saw here, and, you know, kind of stopping in on their statewide tours. Here we have, you know, Corey Stewart uh, being contested, uh, you know, by uh, some of our neighbors uh, here, and myself included. I see a sign back here. This is mine here. It says, Trump dumped Corey. That is Corey Stewart here is running and uh, let's dump let's dump the statues or something like that you know um, so anyway so this is already the the you know politics around monument removal you know really got amped up in, in 2017 it wasn't just the the kind of high profile uh, um, rallies you know hate rallies that went on in the, what we call the summer of hate but it actually started ramping up already in January February you know scuffles on the mall uh, you know, um, rallies and counter protests in the parks like this one. Um, so, and then of course, as we know, uh, you know, the, the most uh, um, egregious attacks, you know, in the summer of hate, especially the Unite the Right rally on August the 12th, uh, 2017, really left this town reeling, you know, um, and doing what we could, you know, why can't we get rid of these things, you know, and then, uh, you know, as, as Corey mentioned in, in my introduction, um, some of us were involved in, uh, 
in lobbying in Richmond three times a week. You know, as soon as the Dems won the 2019 election in November 2019, I basically I didn't have Thanksgiving, Christmas, or New Year's. It was all spent organizing um, with you know members of of the General Assembly and their staff um, and activists and and forming a statewide network of activists in various towns in Northern Virginia and in the 757 and and elsewhere that had been active trying to get rid of their statues, but of course had run into a roadblock with that state law, which prohibited it. And so then come January, you know, we started, uh, you know, we went to the um, to the General Assembly and just were lobbying, you know, in all those committee meetings. And then when it got to the floor and, and uh, was finally um, signed into law. Um, and then of course, uh, um, Albemar County was the first uh, municipality to, uh, under that new law to remove uh, their statue. This was in, I believe, September of 2020. So just a few months after the law took effect. Um, if you notice here, Johnny Reb, I love it because he's he's wrapped in union blue here as he's being <laughs> taken away. So this is in front of the courthouse after his removal. But I want to call attention here. There's some red circles here around the Shenandoah Valley Battlefield Foundation logo on the truck. And the, the Johnny Reb is being uh, removed and taken to that uh, just over the mountains to the west to the Shenandoah Valley um, Battlefield Foundation. Um, but also this little bumper sticker here, which is a little uh, um, kind of a, uh, what you call a dog whistle, as it were. You know, it is a bonnie blue flag. Um, it is uh, one of the national flags um, of the Confederacy. And, and, you know, so kind of a, you know, a, a tip of the hat there. And, and, and also kind of serving notice that this monument was going to a place, uh, you know, notice there were no union decals on that truck or this, anything, but, but rather it's going to a place where uh, the Confederacy is, is celebrated. Um, these are just uh, various uh, photos of, of the sorts of activities that are sponsored by, by the Shenandoah Valley Battlefield Foundation. Uh, this gentleman here, who's a kind of reenactor, you know, in persona of uh, Stonewall Jackson is, you know, kind of selling Confederate branded coffee here at the Shenandoah Valley Battlefield Foundation store at one of their museums. Um, here they are putting in a new Confederate monument. I mean, they're still at it. You know, this was just a, a year or so ago, putting in this new monument at one of their battlefields over there in the Shenandoah Valley. I mean, here again is, you know, celebrating Confederate soldiers at a at a commemorative event. Uh, here's another reenactment event, very disturbing. Uh, you'll see that this gentleman here uh, is again dressed as Stonewall Jackson and then he is uh, pretending to uh, assassinate Abraham Lincoln. And, uh, and this same gentleman then was on our streets, you know, for the Unite the Right uh, rally. So this is the type of uh, celebration of lost cause narratives, you know, that that's going on uh, at these places. So it just really begs the question about where do these statues go after they're removed, you know, and this has been something that's receiving more attention lately. I've written a couple of op-eds about it in the Richmond Times Dispatch and in uh, Slate. Uh, there have been other pieces in the Washington Post and, and Smithsonian Magazine, you know, and elsewhere. Um, what happens when they're removed, you know, and some of us were just horrified and namely, um, uh, Dr. Andrea Douglas, who's the director of the Jefferson School African American Heritage Center, uh, we were just horrified that the Johnny Reb statue was going to a place like this, you know, where it would continue to broadcast those lost cause values, you know, and we said, if it's wrong on our courthouse, it's wrong anywhere. And we don't want to ship our toxic waste over the mountain. Uh, to another community. That's not fair to that community. You know, um, it, you know, if we really feel or are very quite convicted that this is anti-democratic propaganda, uh, we don't, we don't want to ship it somewhere else. And, it, and that really means taking responsibility. I mean, you can just shove it into storage and just leave it there indefinitely. That's what a lot of cities have done, quite frankly, because they don't know what to do. You know, it's such a radioactive trash, you know, that, 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 uh, you know, it's, it's unclear, you know, what, what, what to do with them, you know, um, that is kind of the easy way out, but as any psychologist or therapist worth their salt can tell you that just, you know, taking a problem and, and ignoring it, you know, is not really a solution. It's not a healthy solution. It's not a way forward. You have to kind of work through it, you know? Um, and so we started thinking, you know, what would it mean 
uh, to do something different, you know, with with this with this uh, with these statues when it comes Charlottesville's time, you know, we knew we had, you know, uh, you know, some more time, you know, to, to think about that. Um, and so, you know, and, and in just listening to people in the community, I did, we just heard a refrain so many times, we heard it, you know, like ever since this debate really reopened in 2016 with a petition, um, we ought to just melt it down. People would say that we should melt it down, you know, in a kind of, you know, exasperated kind of way. And even like very responsible uh, civic leaders, I won't name names here, but you get them two drinks in and behind closed doors, a lot of them say, we should just melt it down. Wish we could, I wish we could melt it down, you know? <laughs> um, and so just hearing that, it's like, I'm a person of action. I'm an activist. I, I like doing stuff. I don't like just talking about stuff, you know? So well, well, what would it take? What would it actually take to melt it down? You know, and so we started looking around. We started calling, making phone calls, talking to artists. I learned more about metal alloys than, I mean, my humanities brain was just exploding, <laughs> you know, learning what I was learning about, uh, you know, apparently early 20th century bronze and, you know, and the composition of it is, you know, different than it is now. It's, you know, silicon bronze and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, and oh, and not every crucible can handle this. And about what about, you know, so it was a lot to think about, you know. And a lot of conversations, and there were a lot of people who were very graciously gave of their time to, to help us think through just the very practical nuts and bolts issues of what would it mean to melt this thing down and to come up with a plan and funding for said plan too, because this costs money, you know. Um, but we decided to, to, to do it and, um, and to get together and many of you signed on to the Swords into Plowshares plan and it is a plan to, uh, you know, to, to um, melt down, um, melt down a, uh, you know, a, the, the statue in, in order to make something new. So then, you know, we finally got to, you know, and this is just a few months ago here, you know, last July, 2021. And uh, amazing that something that was there for nearly a hundred years was, I think it was 50 minutes <laughs> or something like by the time, you know, they put the straps on and, and, and by, by the time of liftoff, uh, it was less than an hour. It was just amazing. You know, all that um, turmoil and trauma that we suffered and then it was just gone, you know, and I, I just felt my soul just kind of lifting a little bit. It felt like I could just, you know, breathe easier. Um, you know, this is some very, very harmful propaganda. And the fact that it stood so long in public places without much remark is a perverse testament to its effectiveness as propaganda, you know? Um, and, and, and so, you know, so then, yeah, then the question of, you know, what to do with it. And then of, of course, as, as you know, um, the Jefferson School um, was, was the, uh, the offer that was selected uh, by the Charlottesville City Council unanimously um, in December to, uh, to receive the statue. And it's a great responsibility. I'm really grateful to the Jefferson School uh, for taking this on. Of course, Dr. Douglas is herself an art historian who received her PhD at the University of Virginia. She doesn't do this lightly. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're not kind of like a reflexive iconoclasts, let's put it that way, you know, but, but really this, is, this comes from a place of community care and being concerned about what could happen to another community if this were to go there, because this statue has remained, you know, it, it shows up and if you go, and please don't, but just believe me, <laughs> you go to these alt-right websites, you know, so-called alt-right, you know, white supremacist websites, uh, uh, you know, these statues and this particular statue, the, the Schrady Lintelli uh, uh, statue uh, is, is often used, you know, in their iconography and, and, you know, and it still attracts, it was attracting until it was removed. Uh, white supremacists would come to town and you know, that's where they would come and put their stickers up and this sort of thing. And then we would go along behind and pull those stickers off, you know, from Patriot Front of all places, you know, this is the, the successor organization to, to Vanguard America, the one that, that uh, James, with which James Field was associated, who, who attacked us with, you know, with his car. Um, you know, they, they don't stop, you know, and they won't, and, and we don't need to provide fuel to that, you know, so it's, it's a matter of uh, public responsibility, civic responsibility, really, uh, we see it. Um, and so um, it, it's not just the taking down, it's the, um, the desire to uh, um, make change by engaging the community. That's an important part of the process. And I'm gonna show a quick 
this two minute video here if I can. Uh, well, let me, let's see. I guess I need to stop sharing my PowerPoint before I can share this, this other thing here. Let me try this. Okay. Make sure to share the sound too. Okay, can you see that? The Swords into Plowshares website? Okay, this is sipseville.com. That's S I P Seville uh, dot com. And let's see this here. Hi, I'm Dr. Andrea Douglas, and I'm the executive director of the Jefferson School African American Heritage Center. Our hope with Swords into Plowshares is to create something that transforms what was once toxic in our public space into something beautiful and more reflective of our entire community's social values. This project will take the Lee statue, melt down the bronze, and use the bronze for a new work of public art. It is a community-based project that all of the voices in our community will be able to articulate what we want in our public spaces, as opposed to objects that were given to our community that highlighted a particular ideology that we no longer share. We've been working on this for a long time. In 2015, a young woman, Zion O'Brien, wrote a petition as part of a school project. 700 people signed, and she requested the statues be removed. After a long process and a commission, the city voted uh, to remove the statues. Because we wanted to change, we were attacked by white supremacists. The whole world saw our trauma but more importantly, our resistance. Support for Swords into Plowshares has been overwhelming. Our community will confront white supremacy with creativity. Beauty will heal the ugliness of the past. I think this out project offers a roadmap for communities who are also grappling with what to do with their statues. It's taking something that was static, molding and melding it into a new substance, and then having a community dialogue with an artist about how to transform the material into something new. The process itself is change making. It allows us to understand that history is being made today. And that as we create change, we are in fact creating history. Creativity calls on the best parts of ourselves. It's transformative by its very nature. We're giving people opportunities to engage with our own narratives and our own histories. To make this transformation, we need your help. Please donate to Swords into Plowshares. By donating to Swords into Plowshares, you become part of history. Join us, be part of our team, help us create Charlottesville's new future. All right, so that's, that's the vision um, that we're trying to... Hi. Oh, whoops. I'm Dr. Andrea Douglas, and I'm the executive director of the Jefferson School. We have to start over. <laughs> Our hope with Swords and Plowshares is to create something Sorry. that trans. Sorry about that. Uh, make sure that doesn't happen again. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so what we're trying to do is we, we need to engage our community, and, and we. Um, especially need the help of artists, you know, to help us envision more, uh, you know, what, what were, what are the possibilities uh, for the uses of public space, you know, and I guess, you know, what's important to us, uh, to Dr. Douglas and I, as we were envisioning this is, is the idea of democracy. I work at the Democracy Initiative, uh, and I'm the director of the Memory Project there. And so it's, it's the question of what would it mean to have public spaces that are welcoming um, um, to everyone, not rather than um, telling certain people that they don't belong or, you know, or uh, that uh, the, the people that enslaved your ancestors, uh, you know, are somehow, you know, worthy of, of, of praise, you know, so what, what would it mean if everyone belonged, you know, in public places? So the kinds of questions that we're posing uh, to the community that we want input on, um, um, have to have to do with this about how how do we feel it's a very kind of effective language and you know, how do we feel in public spaces and how do we feel comfortable and again you know <laughs> we do a lot of community engagement in this in this community i mean we did it with the blue ribbon commission 
Um, um, here are, uh, you know, conversations that went on with the memorial um, to enslaved laborers, you know, in, the, in that process, a, an excellent process that really, you know, drew on, on, on public um, input and particularly from the descendants of enslaved uh, workers that, that, that uh, uh, you know, literally um, built the University of Virginia. Um, so we, we're looking to that as a model, you know, that, that sort of community engagement. And, and to that end, we've got uh, Frank Dukes for the Institute for um, Engagement and Negotiation from UVA, uh, who helped to lead the uh, Monument to Enslaved Laborers uh, uh, public engagement and as, um, other projects as well. Um, and so that's that's launching um, um, already right now. I, I don't see Kendall um, King here today, but uh, she is one of our com community ambassadors. Ambassadors there from uh, from Visible Records, and Visible Records indeed is uh, the place where we hope that eventually the commissioned artist uh, can have a studio space there and and interact further with this. So the question of like you know how to feel in in public spaces, and I'm just going to like show some slides here. Of some of my favorite. Uh, monuments and and um, <clears throat> um, and public art, you know, and and, to, and just with just some suggestions of just how I feel, you know, by being in in the presence of these places. Since we were talking about the memorial to enslaved laborers, you know, here it is, and we can see the eyes of Is Isabella Gibbons, you know, kind of etched into um, uh, the the outside, you know, of, of that monument. You know, an excellent design. It, uh, I should say, yeah. Here's Eto Ochitigbe, who's the um, an artist uh, based in New York, uh, you know, who, who helped to design this. And then here is uh, Devon Henry, who's uh, the contractor, the removal uh, contractor. And, and this, you know, after all those, those meetings, you know, this is something beautiful was created, you know, and it, and it was, uh, you know, not just an artist, you know, kind of coming in and taking the material and saying, oh, look at me, you know, but really like, taking, being patient enough and, and a little bit of humility too, you know, to kind of come and to listen, to sit and listen and get to know a community and to hear what are the values. And then, and then using one's, you know, kind of creative energies, you know, to, to, uh, uh, to do this here. Um, so I, I found Johnny Reb, you know, kind of intimidating. It's also just kind of, I mean, you know, it was a mass produced art, you know, didn't have a lot of I didn't think, you know, artistic value, um, you know, um, before it was taken away, it'd been there for 111 years, but, you know, to, to have this on the courthouse lawn where you're supposed to be going for equal justice under the rule of law, uh, under the United States constitution. And here's a statue of the guy that tried to overthrow the constitution, you know, so this is a, just an affront to the 14th amendment, which guarantees, uh, you know, equal protection under law, you know, to, to have this, you know, shoot, it's very aggressive, you know, just as a, as a tableau too, you know, in, in approaching the, the courthouse where, you know, we're, we're supposed to go to the courthouse because we're supposed to resolve problems according to the rule of law without resorting to violence. That is the entire purpose of having a judicial system. And so to have this sort of militaristic imagery of whatever, I mean, that, that's just my personal philosophical is that, you know, even having a union, it's like, you know, we, wanna, we can do better, I think. You know, again, and you know, in terms of of uh, expressing our aspirations for democracy, you know, um, you know, there's defiance. You know, when people couldn't, you know, there was such a sense of frustration here. I think among many of us, when we couldn't get rid of those statues for so many years, you know, um, and so just this this continual, you know, you'd come by every other day. It seemed like, and you know, either the statue had been tagged, or somebody put a sign on it, or you know, something was going on a lot. There was still a lot of reflection going on. Uh, the Memorial, the National Memorial uh, to Lynching Victims in Montgomery, Alabama, where the um, Charlottesville 2018 Civil War, or excuse me, Civil Rights uh, pilgrimage, that was our destination, you know, with the soil from the from the uh, lynching side of Mr. John Henry James, just out here in the in the Albemarle County. We, you know, we went there as a delegation, 150 to go there. Uh, by the way, just um, FYI, we're going to take another civil rights tour this June, in late June. If you're interested in that, ask me about that later. The registration is is uh, open now. It's opening. Um, so yeah, something, it's very mournful being at this, you know, the, these are, are these suspended uh, modules here are, are like bodies. They're kind of like hanging bodies, you know, and when they're laid horizontal, they're like caskets. They're about the size of caskets, you know, so it's very uh, evocative. Um, oh, and I should say, and, and, you know, and each one, each module has a name and place, 
like a, you know, a place where someone was lynched and then the name of that individual and the day they were lynched, you know, so it's very personal and, 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 and yet massive and it's just devastating to go there and to see one hanging for your town, which, you know, it said that, you know, Charlottesville, Virginia, John Henry James, you know, it's just, wow, you know. Um, also, you know, it's part of um, monumental culture, cultural memorialization, uh, which has happened in the past couple of decades, several decades has been, um, you know, kind of more abstraction, you know, away from the figurative realistic and more toward um, recognizing a collective of people. So, you know, in the case of the lynching victims, it's, you know, it's everyone's there and everyone's named in the case of the uh, Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C. that, you know, a young Maya Lin uh, designed. I think she was, what, a senior at, in college at Yale. Um, you know, every name or, you know, uh, you know is, is, is recorded there um, on the walls. You know, you can go in there and take a tracing, you know. Um, and similarly, at the Monument to Enslaved Laborers, the, the names, as much as are known, you know, are also etched in the, in the, in the surface of that memorial. Um, the Civil Rights uh, um, Monument in, in, again, this is in Alabama in front of the Southern Poverty Law Center here. You know, it's a very, you know, it's a let justice roll down like waters. You know, this is a, um, you know, a verse from, uh, I believe, Micah, I think. So Micah, oh, and I should say that, that Swords into Plowshares uh, comes from a verse from uh, Isaiah. Isaiah 2, 4, which says they shall turn their swords into plowshares and their swords or, and their uh, spears into pruning hooks, you know, so taking the implements of war and bellicosity of violence, of hatred, and reforming them, transforming them into something that is life-giving, you know, a, a, a plow, you know, that plows the earth and, 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 you know, grows the crops that give us nourishment, you know. Um, so here, you know, a very reflective uh, kind of place. Um, I find the this is in Berlin. Uh, this is the monument to the murdered Jews of Europe is the full title of it. It's a Holocaust uh, memorial or it's by another Holocaust memorial. And it's, it's just overwhelming. And it's, you know, you, you know, you go down, you know, it kind of goes in peaks and valleys and just all of these blocks, large cement blocks, you know, that are just, that just kind of give a sense for the scale and scope of the tragedy itself, you know of the genocidal attack. Um, some places are kind of evoke curiosity, you know, which is kind of, you know, kind of a open-ended, it's just so open-ended, you know, to be in the, you know, if you, or if you ever go to the Bean in Chicago, if you've been there, you know, kind of, you know, it's, it's playful and, um, oh, and speaking of playful, you know, here's, you know, whimsical, why not? You know, why is it, why has it gotta be about war? Why can't it be about, you know, um, something that's, that's uh, kind of, you know, more creative. Um, and so our first uh, community engagement meeting is coming up on March the 5th, and that's deliberately planned to coincide with Liberation and Freedom Days uh, here, which is the commemoration of the uh, March 5th, uh, March 3rd through 6th uh, arrival of uh, United States troops, federal troops to Charlottesville and the surrender of the town and of the university to, uh, to those forces. Um, and so just a as a way of kind of marking that time and also it it's a way to kind of think ahead, you know, we've, we've, uh, you know, planned this, this engagement meeting uh, for that time. And we really hope that y'all will come and, and uh, invite others to come. We're kind of, we have a community ambassadors like Kendall kind of fanning out now, you know, across, you know, kind of trying to draw people in and, and uh, uh, you know, for this, because we want to hear from you, you know. So um, I'll um, stop my presentation there and um, happy to take questions and, and engage in more dialogue. Well, first, thank you so much for giving us first that background. Um, I certainly learned some new things and, and thought I knew the whole story, but of course there's way more. So thank you for that. Um, and then also taking us through this transformation process as well. Um, so if you've got any questions for, um, for Jolene, um, if you could direct message those to me and I'll kind of organize everything and, and kind of weave it into this discussion. Um, we do have a couple minutes for, for some Q and A. Um, so to get us started, the thing that I just wanted to ask is, how do you find the energy and the stamina to just dig deep when things get really difficult? Because this is a multiple year long process and it just takes 
I'm sure it takes so much out of a person to just be continued in that. So how, how do you do that? Well, I mean, part of this is a way to deal with trauma, I think. I mean, I think like a lot of us, you know, that summer of hate, you know, uh, it left a mark, you know. <laughs> um, I was listening to the judges forum last night, the three candidates for the new, uh, for the soon to be open judgeship uh, uh, in the 16th circuit. And I think it was Nina, Nina Antony, one of the prosecutors here in town said that that summer, you know, stole it stole a part of her soul permanently, you know, it's, it's just, you know, it's left a, it's left a mark on us. And so it behooves us to do something with that, you know, um, you know, if, if you think about these communities that have been traumatized by this, you know, and it's often, it's just a, it's just a blip in the history, Selma. I mean, that name, it's like, we all know what that is. It's Bloody Sunday. It's John Lewis getting beat to a pulp, you know what I mean? And then the, the resounding, uh, you know, the, and then, you know, two weeks later that, you know, finally the march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, which is something we're going to do again on our civil rights tour this morning. You know, this was only several hours, you know, but it, it's just so etched. Well, certainly in the, in the history of that community, but, but in the nation, in national history, similarly, Charlottesville, unfortunately, you know, has become a kind of shorthand for white supremacist violence. So part of this is, uh, th this project is dealing with that and working through that trauma, you know, by doing, as I said in the, in the video, in the promotional video, um, by, you know, beauty can heal hatred, you know, um, creativity, you know, can be transformative. So that's, that it, it it's, it's uh, healing in part you know, uh, to do this. And it's also, it's a life's work. I mean, I've said to Dr. Douglas, you know, many times I said, it doesn't matter what we do for the rest of our lives. This is going to be in our obituary. <laughs> these are the, these are the crazy black women that melted down General Lee, you know, <laughs> this is, you know, something, you know, but it's open space. And we're, we're, we're insistent on doing this because we want to broaden the range of possibilities, you know, for these statues. And, and I have to say, like, I don't think that every statue should be melted down you know, but this particular one, because it has been this rallying cry, it's also, um, it's a very, uh, uh, boy, the aesthetic value of it is bad. I, I call it, you know, it's the Schrady Lintelli piece because Schrady died uh, halfway. He'd made his mold, but he died, you know, because he was late because he was working on his magnum opus, which was the Grant uh, monument in DC, ironically. So he dies, you know, and then Lintelli, the, you know, another artist comes in to finish it. And it's a very poorly uh, crafted uh, sculpture, I have to say, um, you know, it's just, it's something that was noted even at the time when it was installed, the, the installation speakers kind of felt a need to in their speeches to kind of like give a, a public work around and to answer the murmurs that were out there, you know, in, in the public, it's, it's, it's not very pretty. Um, so for, you know, for mainly um, ethical reasons, but, but also aesthetic, it's like the art world will not uh, feel the loss, you know, of this particular statue of Lee. There are much better ones you know, in existence. Actually, any other one is, is better than this one. So yeah, it's a way of uh, working through, I think, uh, the trauma. You know, it, it helps to give me energy and especially hearing ideas from other folks and talking to artists. Yeah, um, I think it's particularly beautiful that that's, it's, it's sort of like a transformation, right? It's a transformation of that trauma into action. Um, and I think so much of, of just this resurgence that we've seen in, you know, equality and the civil rights movement from, I almost said last year, but from 2020, 2020 was not last year, um, is, you know, it's, it's one of those things that I know from my perspective as a Black woman, that never stopped. It never stopped for us. We have continued to be fighting this, right? Continue to make sure that everybody has equal justice. Um, but it's been this resurgence for other folks. And because we've been so sustained in this, um, I kind of wanted to just ask the question of, as you're sort of, as you're doing your work as a Black woman, um, do you feel that at some point this weight of continuing this forward motion um, should transfer to other folks? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, yeah, and and I feel like you know there's there's been uh, there's been you know quite 
a bit of allyship. I mean, I just want to kind of go back to this this uh, picture here, if I can. Where is that? Yeah. Um, you know, you'll notice there are a lot of white folks in here. You know, there are a lot of white folks that also don't like white supremacy, <laughs> you know, and, and say that they don't want this to be their legacy or somehow, you know, I identified with it, you know, as approving of this, you know, by virtue of the melanin or, you know, lack thereof, you know, in the, in their skin, you know? Um, and so, yeah, it behooves them to, you know, to, to step up. It's like, we especially I would say, you know, it's like white folks are the ones that benefit from this. So they really need to, you know, step up, you know? And I, I think, you know, there's been a, there's been a group of folks here who, you know, who've, who've done that, but does it need to be, I, th I think we all need to be involved in this. And, and I have to say, you know, for this project, we, I mean, we want to hear from everybody, everybody that has a stake in having democratic public space. So it's like, you know, it's like, if you want to show up and say, oh, put General Lee back, it's like, no, that's, that's not what this is about. We're going forward, you know, but we especially want to hear from, uh, from descendants, you know, um, you know, we're, we're going to kind of give a, you know, kind of a special ear, you know, to, to that uh, constituency, you know. Um, so, yeah, I think, I mean, there, there have been people getting involved, you know, and, and uh, um, it's, you know, that, that was one of the things about, you know, some of these Black Lives Matter protests is that, there, you know, there are some of the old, old heads, you know, from the civil rights movement era, you know, who were, you know, kind of getting on in age now said what, you know, how surprising it was to see, you know, so many young white folks that, that had come out too. And, you know, it's kind of crazy, but back in the day during the Blue Ribbon Commission, there were some people, the, those who favored keeping the statues, white people who favored keeping the statues, who criticized the white people who came out against the statues, uh, saying that they were trying to talk over black people or something. And I was just like, no, they're not. It's like, you know, there, there's a lot of us out here, especially younger black activists that wanted those statues gone. And, um, you know, and we need uh, a lot of folks in the coalition, you know, to, to do this work, not just, you know, with art and public space, but just in, in civic life as well, you know. Um, so yeah, I, I, you know, hope that um, other folks, you know, not just black folks are, you know, inspired to, uh, to join this struggle because white supremacy is bad for everybody. It's bad for everyone, you know. It truncates empathy, you know, and, and it, yeah, it, it just kills, kills the soul, you know, and, and kills the body, and, you know, some, for some of us, you know. It absolutely does. Um, and I, the, the reference to, you know, with the Johnny Reb statue going over to the, the Shenandoah, um, uh, I've written on the name of it. The Shenandoah the Valley Battlefield Foundation. Yeah. Toxic waste. That was the perfect, you know, simile for that. And and it it it's really this. We've got to get rid of our toxic waste. We can't give that to somebody else. Um. And and we've got to work through that. So just right. so appreciative of of the work that you're doing. Yeah. Um. If any does anybody else have any questions? Um. We could probably we could probably have time for one more. Um. And you know, kind of while we're waiting, see if anybody has has something else. Um, so after this this community engagement me meeting, ideally, what's next? Yeah. So what we're doing is that we want to have at least three large scale, like once a month, of these larger um, meetings, community engagement meetings, where you know, kind of a larger group comes together. But in the interim, in the three weeks interim, the community ambassadors are going to be going out. They're kind of, you know, tendrils out into the community, um, into their various spaces in the community. Like, for, you know, for instance, uh, Kendall, who's very well connected here, you know, in this, in this, in the arts community here, um, you know, others who are, uh, you know, kind of plugged in with the, the religious community, you know, will be going there. Others, you know, kind of advocacy or, you know, you know, and this sort of thing. And in order to kind of, you know, we're, we're doing that because, you know, it's, it's not just the, this isn't the, Dr. Douglas and Jelaine show or something, you know, it's really, this is a community effort, you know, and we really need to hear from people, you know, so in, so there'll be monthly meetings, you know, like this, these large ones, but then, you know, you, you'll, you know, be getting phone calls and emails from these, you know, these ambassadors saying, hey, you know, you want to, you know, either maybe when it gets warmer, come hang out on my porch or something, or we can meet at a park or, you um, uh, you know, meet online, you know, you know, on, on Zoom, if it's raining or something, you know, um, so that's, that's what's going to be going on. And you'll start seeing this in the media, 
uh, as well. We're gonna, as we're launching this, it'll be, you know, there'll be a press release issued and, uh, you know, with um, kind of introducing the public to this process and inviting people uh, to be involved. Excellent. Yeah. Um, well, I, oh, go ahead. Oh, I, I wanted to say that, that uh, I wanted to, to give a shout out to Boonmi Collins, who's here uh, uh, with us, uh, who uh, um, helped us uh, with this logo. You know, this was so, so quickly it came together. Once we won the vote, you know, in city council, we had to just do a quick turnaround. And uh, she is uh, amazing uh, professional, you know, and, and was so uh, enthusiastic. And anyway, just wanted to, um, to give a shout out to her. You know, she's juggling business. <laughs> she's doing great. A beautiful, beautiful design. Um, so thank you for breathing life into that. Um, as we're talking about breathing, bringing life, bringing things here. Yeah. Um, well, so there weren't any further questions. Um, so you know, I just wanted to, on behalf of everybody here, I wanted to thank you for your time, um, not for just this morning, but over the past several years, um, and and bringing bringing something transformative to the community. Um, and also giving us an example of, of persistence and hard work and, and really going after something. You just, you just kind of keep pouring your heart into it um, and you'll make it. So thank you. Absolutely. Well, thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. We're so happy to have you. Um, and then thank you to everybody in the audience. Um, it is always a delight to have you. Um, as the weather gets warmer, hopefully as some things calm down with the pandemic, um, I'm hoping that we'll be able to return in person. Um, but thanks for coming on Zoom anyways, as we are in this weird pandemic era. Um, appreciate you all and have a great Friday. Yeah. See you next time. All right. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Mm -hmm.